In this edition of Garden Talk with the Tulsa Master Gardeners, we talk about overseeding fescue and using pre-emergence as a way to fight weeds in your lawn. We'll also discuss several fall garden crops you can still plant, and we'll answer some of your garden questions. Welcome to Garden Talk. Hey everybody, we're back. We took a little bit of a break there for a while. We did some live Q and A's on uh, Facebook for a while. That's pretty fun, wasn't it, Brian? It was. It was a, it was a pretty good time. But uh, you know, I, I, we we've liked this format on our podcast, so we're kind of excited to get this thing going again. Yeah, and one reason I think I kind of prefer this is is we can talk about some things that maybe need to be talked about rather than just answering questions. If no, like for example, we're going to talk about uh, overseeding fescue today and pre-emergence in that live Q and A format. If nobody asked about that, we didn't talk about that. But now is the time to be be talking about it, uh, overseeding and pre-emergence. Yeah, it, it's perfect timing. I mean, right now we've got kind of we're, we're hopefully in a fall pattern. I know the the evenings and the mornings are sure enough cooler. And I, it sure was welcome for me. I, I'm, I'm excited to see it and, you know, starting to see some leaves turning colors a little bit. And, and it's, it's changing seasons. So I'm, I'm, I'm pretty excited. And, you know, like, like, Tom, like you said, Tom, we've got, a, got kind of quite a bit of things we can be doing right now in our garden to kind of get them ready for, for winter, we'll get ready for fall, and then, you know, even getting them ready for, you know, coming up and being strong next spring. So it right. should be a good show. We've got a, kind of, kind of good, good layout on subjects, and I'm ready to get started. Well, first, let's talk about uh, overseeding fescue. Uh, maybe it's just me because I, I've been doing that. I just did it like last week, and I got all those little green little the little sprouts popping up, and uh, nothing is really – probably something is, but it's pretty darn satisfying to uh, sow those seeds out there, and then you start seeing them actually come up, and your yard start to green back up. So uh, it, it's time to overseed. It is, and, you know, it, it is a perfect time. And as early in the fall as we can get it, and like you said, as soon as you get that green growth growing, um, that's just a heads up and, and a, more ahead of the game than what you will be. So, uh, yeah, no, now's perfect time. Um, we've been getting quite a bit of calls this, this summer um, on, on fescue and it not looking very good. And, you know, and, because, and I think one of the reasons because we were kind of moist. We had a lot of moisture in the air, a lot of humidity. Um, that, in turn, if you've listened to us any at all, with that disease triangle, moisture in the air, perfect conditions for disease, and that's kind of what we've had. Uh, brown patch has taken a bunch of our fescue out. Uh, it's, it's been worse on other years, but it is that time of year where you go in and, and brown patch comes in and, and basically wipes everything out or spots it up bad enough where we need to go in and, and renovate or reseed or overseed, whatever, whatever you term your use would be. But nope, now's it. Now's a good time, Tom. I, you know, I noticed you've been out in the nursery shopping a little bit for seed. And that's another question we get. Um, what kind of seed is the best seed? And, you know, I, what I like to say is they're all pretty decent. All of the, the higher end seeds, you're not, don't buy the cheapest seed. Um, but, you know, the higher end seeds, it's probably, you know, you're probably looking at about $2 a pound, Tom. What, what Do you remember what you paid for your seed? That's about well, right. I got a, I got a 50 pound bag and it was a little over a hundred dollars. So about, about two pounds, two and a half pounds, uh, two and a half dollars uh, to $2 a pound is probably what you can expect. Um, you know, the smaller the bag, the more you're going to pay. But, you know, I would stay away from those seeds under a dollar. Um, you know, those are more, you know, we have two types of fescue we have, you know, that we have in Oklahoma. We have a forage type fescue that is bred and grown to grow forage for cattle, for horses, things like that. So that type is going to grow up and it's going to be real tough, real thick bladed uh, versus a turf type which is what we're going to be talking about and what you need to look for uh, a turf type tall fescue uh, when we're out there um, searching for what kind of seeds to buy. Um, another thing to look for is multiple varieties in, in one box or in one bag. Um, a, a multiple variety of one tall fescue is called a blend of fescue. So, I'm going to use the term five star. That's that's a retail name that you may see quite a bit. 
And that, that product usually has five, that blend usually has five turf type tall fescues in there mixed up. Um, Tom, you was telling me about Heartland Supreme. That is a mixture. You might talk about that mixture a little bit. Well, I, it, it is a mixture. There's five different grass seeds in there. Uh, as you can see on the graphic here, just for example, I've got one that's called an Avenger. There's a Titanium, a Valkyrie. They've got some perennial rye, and they've got some bluegrass in there. So uh, hopefully one or most or all of those are going to latch on and grow in your yard. And, and that's kind of the ideas of, of mixing a few of those species in. I think you know, you said they had a turf type tall fescue. Uh, you right. can you you've seen the seen the the screen. Uh, three turf type tall fescues, one ryegrass, and then one bluegrass. So the ryegrass, what it, it it tends to really germinate pretty fast. So you know, you seeded a week ago, and a lot of those seeds that you're seeing right now, that that ryegrass is probably going to take three or four days to germinate. So it's going to be real quick. The fescue and the bluegrass, it's gonna it's gonna be a little slower, maybe ten days, seven to ten days after you know you seed. So the ryegrass is thrown in there to really get some green up pretty quick, and then the bluegrass is in there. Um, you know what happens? Our fescue can sometimes get a few other diseases that may show up that bluegrass does not get affected by. So if we have another species in there like bluegrass then if that disease attacks our fescue, then we're still able to, sh to mask or hide that disease with the bluegrass in that mixture. So pretty, pretty neat deal that, that OSU and other universities have kind of done some research on the numbers and percentages. Not much percentages, as you could have seen. You know, you're looking at about a 5% uh, volume uh, for ryegrass and bluegrass and then about a 30% on the, the fescue. So the majority of it's fescue, and that's what we want. But then we throw some other things in there to kind of take that, you know, monoculture or that one type of grass away where we can mask or hide that, that disease. Um, right. So it works pretty well, pretty well. So if we're going to reseed, first thing we do, we got our, we got our, seed, we got our seed picked out. I usually tell people it depends on uh, your yard, really, but if you have bare spots with dirt to rough that up, grab a rake and rough it up a little bit. Just don't put your seed out on that hard soil. But obviously, if you're, if you're going to be overseeding in the turf, you can't do that, that roughing up very well. But I always rough it up first. Yeah, and, you know, a lot of people, you know, they, they ask me on the phone, hey, do I need to aerify? Do I need to poke some holes where I can drop them seeds in those holes? And, and uh, the aerification is okay. It's not necessarily needed every time. And a lot of times we're in shadier areas where it's a little more moist, where our fescue grows. So it doesn't always need an aerification. Uh, it doesn't always hurt anything either. So, uh, but, but don't just aerify, just aerify. I mean, there's got to be a reason. But I like to rake things up. And what I tell people is the more work you do on that ground, you know, tilling it as much as tilling it on into just using a rake and roughing it up off that, you know, that crusty layer off. Um, and then getting that dead fescue back off there, exposing, exposing that soil so you can have good soil to seed contact. Uh, is why we rake that and why we get that soil exposed. Because when that when that little bitty seed sprouts, the first thing coming out is a root. So that root's going down and it's going to start trying to pull up moisture. And if it can start pulling up moisture, then it's going to send a shoot up, a, a leaf. And then after that leaf comes up, then it's almost ready to start going. So, um, yeah, so now we're getting into that. And, you know, the one one of the major things we do is I, we, we, we put too much seed on the ground. Um, we, we end up overpopulating it and it works great. You know, we can double the rates um, and it'll look good for a month or two, but then what happens, they're so close together, they, they outcompete themselves and they, they end up making a weaker plant that if it dries out or if some disease happens, then it'll, it'll choke them out and kill it uh, real quick. So it's better to be on the light side. My numbers are about five to six five to eight pounds, five to eight pounds on a pretty blank lawn per thousand square feet of seed. So five to eight for, for an old, just kind of a, you know, an overseed where it doesn't have very much. And then you can kind of work your way down depending on how thick 
your current grass is at the at the moment. So, uh, you know, don't don't put down too much seed. Is kind of my my bottom line on that, Tom. Yeah, I know. I've I've been guilty of that mistake as as well. And also, the uh, dreaded you you put out your seed because we're supposed to have a nice little nice light rain and then it pours down and all your seed washes down the hill and you got this this row of, of really big piles <laughs> and it's the same as fertilizer people tend to want to fertilize before rain but then it could wash it all away so just keep that in mind and you know it's not hard you don't need to water once we seed uh then we need to water we need to water every day maybe on you know days like today where we're in 80s 80 high 80s um you may need to water in the morning and you may need to water in the afternoon for a while the main thing is is to keep that soil bed moist as you know moist as possible, not wet, just moist. So you know within a week we ought to be seeing some green like you you was talking about, and then within two weeks we really ought to be looking pretty good. And that's kind of where you said your lawn was at, Tom. Well, it, it, it's starting to starting to get there. It's kind of fun to sit there and watch those watch those little green uh, blades start coming out of the ground when you just got bare dirt. We had some work done on our yard. And so it's all, it's just bare dirt. So we're starting from scratch all over again. But uh, yeah. I, I do think I have learned just from personal experience, like what you said, the watering is the key. If you just sprinkle that seed out there and don't keep it wet and moist, it's going to lay out there and dry up and maybe, maybe die in, in the sun, even possibly get, just get baked. Yeah, well, and the bad thing, you know, once that little root that I was talking about earlier starts germinating and going down, and then even the, that that shoot, even that shoot that comes up, if it that's kind of the main time, and we cannot dry that out because that's little tender tender cells there. And if it dries out, it's going to kill it, and you've wa- you've wasted your time, and you're going to have to reseed. So um, about three days in, be sure and keep that water going, and you know, hopefully we can get it up there where those roots can start pulling up moisture so very critical time at that point but you know the main thing is is to you know to not put too much seed down Uh, another question we get a lot is when do i fertilize and uh, basically you know i i like to look ahead and uh, soil samples are great you know it's a good tool to have if you don't know what you've got in your soil um you know your p and k like we've talked about your phosphorus and potassium if we're le- if our levels uh, are not, you know, if we need to correct the levels on the P and K uh, at this point. And then we can start adding some nitrogen in a few weeks. I, my answer to them on when to fertilize is about the time you need to mow it. So about, you know, two inches, three inches tall. Once, you're, once you need to get the mower out, then it's probably time to start mowing a little bit and start, you know, uh, going, you know, fertilizing as well. So, um, so yeah, we've, we've got it seeded. We've got it germinated, and we're almost to the point now where we're getting ready to mow. So then we start talking about fertilizing. So during the fall, you probably need to fertilize it two times. Uh, I would probably fertilize it, you know, coming up in a couple weeks and then about 30 to 40 days. And that's that's with just nitrogen. Um, urea, I love urea, which is 4600 uh, at a rate of two pounds per thousand square feet. Uh, that's, that's, uh, that's all we need. It doesn't take much. Um, and that urea will get it up. That's nitrogen that'll get grow. It'll get it growing, and then you should start having to mow every <laughs> mowing again every every you know week or so on fescue during the fall. We're talking about overseeding fescue now, primarily because fall's the best time to do that. You can do it in the spring, but we get really got to fight it and keep it watered and, and baby it to help it have a better chance of success. But in, if we reseed in the fall, it's got all fall and winter and spring to get better established for uh the summer that's going to hit us more yeah likely yeah and another thing you're going to hear us say you know in the future months is once those leaves start falling um be sure and get them off there because you know we tend to want to put fescue underneath underneath trees that's where bermuda grass doesn't grow um and you know fescue will survive but it won't thrive because it needs quite a bit of sun um it doesn't like shade it likes being in the sun so um, if we, you know, if we got it underneath a tree, once those leaves fall off, we got to get them off those, that canopy of that, that grass. That way it'll start picking up some of that sunlight and try to get as much growth as we can before we get into that stressful time when those leaves get back on the trees coming up in April. So, uh, thing, you know, again, we said we're thinking we're doing things now for later on, and it's definitely, definitely the case with fescue. Well, and there's really... It, it's quite depressing if you have done all the work to get your seed and you've watered and it's up and it's going great and the leaves 
start falling out there in your yard and you can't get out there in time and then you get out there and all that nice new pretty green is all yellow <laughs> uh, yeah but but again i mean you don't hardly use tough uh and fescue in the same sentence but it's pretty tough especially in the fall um you know it's cool enough or you're not using a lot of moisture um so it it will it will withstand a little bit of leaves on top but as soon as you can get out there and get it get it off there, the better off you're going to be. Because the the idea is preparing preparing fescue for the July and August months or June. We can even say June, June, July, and August months when we've got hot, we've got disease pressure, um, and you know it's just not a good time to grow. You know, and then we've got canopy from the leaves on the trees. So right. we're preparing everything for for you know those hot summer months coming up in 2021. All right, so now is the perfect time to be doing it. The weather's great. It's not too hot. It's not too cold. It's just right. And uh, if you need to or we're thinking about it, get out there and get some seed and, and get after it because it's not going to get much better than this, I, in my view. Nope, it's not. But, again, don't put too much seed down. Let's <laughs> start there. Um, I, I'm guilty as everybody else. So try to stay below at least. 10 pounds per thousand square feet if you're putting that on there getting a little heavy so be careful so uh yeah. happy watering and get out there and get it planted yeah all right so another thing we uh talk about we're talking about turf a lot this episode but uh pre-emergence it's about time to put down some pre-emergence to deal with those weeds again we're, we're thinking about the future when we're putting down pre-emergence Yep. So we're kind of in the second second season of the year with our with our pre-emergent with our weeds. So we kind of went went through the process of our warm season weeds. You know, basically they germinate germinate in the spring and basically all summer and then grow and then put on seeds and then die usually in in the fall. And that's kind of where we're at. Um, and then we have another season where the seeds are germinating. The winter weed seeds are germinating right now. And so we need to put another pre-emergent on right now. And that's going to keep that hen bit, that poa anna, those winter type weeds from, from germinating uh, throughout the winter in our, in our Bermuda grass or in our warm season lawns. Um, in our fescue lawns, we need to be a little careful. If we're overseeding, that pre-emergent is going to keep those seeds from germinating. So with that in mind, if we do overseed now, we want to put it off putting a pre-emergent on until we get a good growth on our fescue uh, at this point of time. But, but yeah, now's a good time. Um, a lot of homeowners are, are going to be looking, if they're going to do it themselves, they're going to be looking at a granular pre-emergent, which works pretty well. Granular pre-emergents, basically, you've got a material, whether it's a clay material or a corn cob material that is a carrier, and then they coat the outside of that material with that pre-emergent and then it dries out and then they put it in a bag you spread it out on your lawn and then when it rains it releases that material down into the soil and it's basically a layer of of chemical that keeps weed seeds from germinating it's a little more complicated than that but that's basically uh, basically it um, a couple different products you may see um, Ballon, um, you may see, you may see some pendimethalin, uh, you may see crabgrass preventer. Um, the main thing is, is you'll, you'll read on that bag and it'll say a pre-emergent or a preventer, a weed preventer. Those type products are what to look for. And, and there's a list of them on our website and Tom can put the, uh, the link on that to, to point you to those products. But the main thing is, is to get them on now. And then that's going to last for, you know, up until we need to put it on again coming up in February. So uh, now's the perfect time to do that in our lawn and especially our warm seasons. And then if our if our fescue's up and going, then we can put it down on that if we have a weed pressure or weed problem. All right. Well, let me just show here on the website real quick how people can get to that. We've got some pretty nice little uh, calendars for Bermuda and fescue. First thing you do is you go to our our, our website, TulsaMasterGardeners.org. Click on this button, the Lawn and Garden Help. That takes you to this page. And if you click here on Turf, Turf Grasses, open that up and you'll see right here, we've got the Master Gardener uh, calendars for both fescue and 
Bermuda, and it'll give you uh, recommendations on uh, the uh, pre-emergence and when to when to seed and when to weed and when to feed and when to water and when to mow and all those things. There, uh, if if there's any uh, sheets that we've given out more of in the Master Gardener office, I can't imagine what they are other than these two Bermuda and uh, fescue sheets. And fescue sheets, yeah, I'm pretty pretty good sheets that still water produced there, and you know timing timing's everything, and um, you know. I, is just you know now's not the time to be fertilizing Bermuda grass. It's time to be putting on uh, pre-emergent. So uh, good timely topic on that one, Tom. And yes, those sheets are good. And there's a lot of information in that website there under our turf grass section. And and again, if you have any questions, just just jot us an email, shoot us an email, and hopefully we can get it answered that way. But but I you know a lot of different you know there I did talk about the granular pre-emergent. Also, there's also some liquid pre-emergence out there too if you all prefer i've got a larger lawn uh, i'm going to use a liquid pre-emergence so i've got a i bought a you know i think i bought a gallon of it and i bought it at a farm store and uh, it works works pretty well and i use about you know an eighth of it i don't use too much of it so i've got enough for a couple years uh, and you know it, it, it it's just sprayed out on with a sprayer so uh, you can do either way and they all you know it's all the same idea all the same active ingredients for the most part but just timing again is perfect for it Tom right well I, one thing that we have to mention and I have I have done this in the past and in a previous previous to my master gardener life is uh, pre-emergence and reseeding fescue do not mix well they do not go together if you put down your pre-emergent for the weeds and then you go out there and and reseed with your fescue seeds nothing is going to happen <laughs> because yeah that's bad seed you just bought they did two-year-old seed is terrible <laughs> yeah it's 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 i did something wrong i didn't know what i was doing no you put the pre-emergent down my problem was we had a lawn service if they would come out and fertilizer and put down the pre-emergent i didn't really know what they're doing i'd go mm -hmm. out there and put out the seed and they would never come up and i just thought i am terrible at growing turf but it was because of the pre-emergent yeah, and, and that brings up another point that a lot of people will ask. You know, we have service service companies that do these, whether they put pre-emergent down or whether they put fescue down. And sometimes there's there's two different companies. So uh, if your pre-emergent company comes in and does that, um, you might as well give up on on seeding your fescue lawn. So you know, be sure and be talking to them and you know, saying, hey, we're we're going to be, you know, we're going to be putting fescue seed down pretty quick, and hopefully they hadn't came out and, and did that yet. But uh, on the pre-emergent, but just be sure and be on the same page if you are using a service company or, or two different service companies for those those two different services. But you know, those companies do a good job again on in town, and you know, there's some better than others. And and uh, the main thing is is timing, and you know, I, it's this is something that it's not that difficult. I know time is important for all of us. And um, if, you know, if you feel, if you, if you're more comfortable uh, letting somebody do it, hey, they can get it done. But, but this is something you can do also. It's not, it's not that difficult. If, if you want to save a little bit of money, um, it, it, it's not rocket science, really. It's just timing is, is the, the whole idea. But, but yeah, pre-emergent, definitely the perfect timing for it. Talking perfect timings. I guess maybe the bulk of the uh, fall garden preparation, fall vegetable garden preparation or planting is probably passed, but there's still some things we can, uh, we can get out there. This time of year is good for, uh, for spinach and lettuce and mustard, radishes, and then pretty quick here, garlic. So it's be a good time to be out there shopping for your garlic to uh, plant, but that's, don't give up. I know my tomatoes, they look terrible, but they're still producing like a son of a gun. We've got almost more cherry tomatoes than we, we, we can eat which most of the summer, they just were kind of stagnant and sitting there. So fall gardens, I'm a huge fan of fall gardens. Those, those tomatoes, if we can get them to survive the summer and into the fall like now, they're going to kick back up. And uh, it's, it's almost, I mean, it, it's a lot. We've got a lot of cherry tomatoes. We're, we're eating all the cherry tomatoes that we want, put it that way. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, speaking of gardens, I've got a pretty good pumpkin patch. And, you know, it's probably to a thousand square foot. I think it's a thousand. I got a couple rows of pumpkins that have really got out. And, you know, they were look, looking pretty good. A couple of weeks ago, I noticed some powdery mildew. Um, powdery mildew right now is a perfect time for a lot of powdery mildew and in on the pumpkins. Um, and then I noticed the last few days, the center of the garden or the pumpkin patch is starting to yellow and kind of uh, wilt. And, and when I went out there to go turn a few of those fruit, because I didn't want a, a bad spot on the bottom, so I turned a few of those pumpkins. And now they're probably 
they're not quite mature, but they're getting pretty big. Um, I noticed a whole hell of a lot of squash bugs, and I'm talking thousands of squash bugs. And I, you know, prior to, you know, a couple weeks ago, I probably could have sprayed something uh, on those pumpkins, but I, you know, everything was looking good. And I, I saw a few bugs, squash bugs, but I decided just to let it go. And then, you know, a few days ago, I noticed those spots dying and then tons of them. Well, you know, those are our adults at this time, and they're very difficult to control. So I've elected, I've got pumpkins out there that are big enough. I'm just going to let them go. And then once the pumpkins are ripe, I'm going to remove those vines. And, and I probably won't spray anything. I'll probably just till that area up, try to bury those, those bugs if they're still there. But um, I'm going to try to get rid of those vines and I'm going to burn them uh, or get them off property because they'll just make more. But I did notice a lot of squash bugs in, in my pumpkins as of late. Um, my asparagus, asparagus is burning and looking, still looking pretty good. And, and uh, I've been keeping it fertilized and watered. And then my okra, I cut it, ended up cutting it down. It's, um, you know, it got too tall. And then the seeds or whatever that variety was, wasn't very good. So I decided to, you know, it was coming out and those okras were, even when they were little, they were still going to be small. So um, that, that's kind of the, that's kind of, I just cut those down. So I'm left with pumpkins and, and, uh, and some asparagus. That's, that's, that's from <laughs> well, it spring. sounds like it's a uh, race to the finish for your pumpkins. Who's, who's the winner going to be the squash bugs or the pumpkin? Nah, it, I, I, mine are big enough. I think they're going to make it. So I, I'm, I'm kind of excited by it. And the girls are excited too about those pumpkins. So. Yeah, well, I'm, we're going to have a crop of green fall green beans there in a few weeks too. They're looking pretty good. But anyway, yeah. again, good, on good. A, if you're still wanting to do your fall garden, there's still some things to plan. And again, on our website, go to our website, Lawn and Garden Help, Vegetables, and there's an entire click on fall gardening, and it'll give you the entire schedule for everything that you you can still plant and uh, have in your have in your fall garden, and even some stuff that will overwinter, some of that really hardy stuff that will you bet you bet through the winter. So. Uh, Speaking of stuff changing, we've been uh, getting a lot of questions in our uh, diagnostic center. People send in pictures saying, what's going on? What's going on? What's going on? Yeah. And uh, sometimes it's, it's just seasonal. I don't know. Here's one we got from uh, somebody. I don't remember the name. It's this rose. And this rose, uh, it's, those leaves don't look very good. Yeah, and you know, I was looking at this before we started, and you know, I think it, it's getting fall, and like you said, it's kind of, kind of, we've we've had quite a few calls of people, you know, hey, my red bud leaves are kind of starting to fall off, or my elm tree leaves are kind of, kind of fading a little bit. But this rose you have here on the screen, um, you know, you see that the yellowing and and kind of browning. Um, there's probably some disease on that. It's probably black spot that we know of back, you know, in the springtime, that's just kind of coming back a little bit. Um, at this point in the game, I don't know if I would really do anything about it. Uh, we don't have a lot of new growth on our roses, and on this one I don't see a lot of new growth. So, you know, those leaves will fall off. Um, the main thing to do once once winter happens, the rose leaves falls off, is to get those out of there. Um, go ahead and rake those up and throw them away. I don't know if I'd even compost these leaves um, just because they, there's probably two or three different types of, of fungal diseases on there. And um, just just pick them up, gather them up, don't compost them, and either throw them in the trash or, you know, if you've got ability to burn them or, or whatever. But get them, get them away, get them off site. Um, again, I don't think I would worry too much uh, about it uh, at this point in the game. Being in, speaking of roses on pruning, I, I would hold off on pruning roses uh, until the spring if you can. Uh, I've got one at my house that's got a little bit out of control. I may nip it back a little bit coming up if I've got pruners in my hand, but, you know, just to kind of keep it under control. But what's going to happen, it may start re-sprouting um, shoots. And those new shoots that re-sprout this late in the game are, are going to freeze out. And when they freeze out, it can introduce some disease that way and, and kind of slow that rose down. So try to hold off on pruning on a lot of different things up until we get to late, late winter or even early spring. Here's another one that came in with a, uh, a hosta that's not looking too good. I guess my first impression would be to say it, it's getting kind of burnt out by the sun. But uh, what do you think, Brian? You know, I, yeah, that could be it. But I, I think it's tired. I think it's kind of done. It's tired. It's, <laughs> it's just tired. 
that's kind of, I don't know how else to really explain it, but I, I've noticed mine, and, and I bet a lot of you also have too, where they've kind of done their thing. Um, they put a lot of leaves on, and, they, you know, the temperature or the day's lengths are getting shorter, and, you know, that, that triggers that plant inside to, to get ready for wintertime, start producing, um, you know, more stuff for the roots and kind of get it ready for the wintertime. And I think that's what's happened here. Uh, you can kind of you can kind of see some uh, browning outer margins and probably some disease, uh, probably some fungal disease, but it's nothing. Those are that's just disease that really attacked that weak leaf that's not really fighting things off anymore. Mm-hmm. So you know we're not quite time to prune that off or get that out of there. But you know in another month or so you can probably chop that back mulch over it and it'll go to bed for the winter and go on so i at this point i again like the rose i don't think we would do much to that hosta um you know it may spring a fungicide may slow that progression down but it you know in 10 20 30 days it's it's really going to be done anyway so that's kind of the way i would look at it right makes sense yeah, well, and it's probably a, a similar situation this is a, a photo that was sent into us this our, one of our viewers was concerned about their Chinese pistache tree that would it's we are in mid September and look at it it's already turning yellow they were concerned it had some sort of disease uh, what do we do and yes. once again I'm going to guess you're going to say that it's uh, fall related it, it's tired right <laughs> it, it's it's getting it is and the you know kind of the first question I would ask what did it do last year did it did it do a similar you know, did it do the similar coloring kind of early? And, yeah, it's a little early, but once you get to thinking, you'll drive through the roads and you'll see quite a bit of these color, this color out in the, in the forested area, if you will. Um, this does, you know, this early premature fall color does signal stress. So she was correct or he was correct in, in assuming that, but – you know, if that tree's healthy, if it looked pretty, you know, looked good all year long, if it kind of did the same thing last year where it colored early um, and you don't see any obvious damage on it, I would call it good. I would just call it, you know, we've got uh, we've got early fall coloring and that's just just part of it. If we get one or two limbs that do that, I would go back and inspect that tree a little bit more, you know, see if we've got damage on the leaves see if we've we've got some issue on the trunk or you know any damage anywhere basically and uh but i i'm i'm gonna guess this when this picture was sent in yesterday so uh you know that's gonna be the the end of september middle of september so i'm gonna guess and i'm just gonna say that this is fall color is what this is all right well nothing about 2020 seems to be normal so we'll we'll say they're tired we're tired we're <laughs> it's, it's yeah. all a part of the Part of the deal. Part of the deal. And Tom, you know, like I said, you know, I got a, I got a call yesterday on a, on a, a maple. Uh, no, it was a redbud tree, and it was spotting up pretty good. And it, it had lost about a third of its leaves already. And they were concerned. It was five years old. It was. I'm going to call it halfway mature. And um, you know, I, I, this time of year, it just kind of everything, you know, starts getting leaf spots on it. And then they just go ahead and fall off. And that, that's what I tell them. I just, like we did on the roses and those other, we just, just kind of let it go into dormancy, pick those leaves up and get them off there if you think there is some fungal issues. And then, you know, hopefully everything will be good. But, but you can expect it. Uh, see if there's trunk damage. See if there's any obviously spottings on the leaves that we can get identified. But in general, it's, it's just this late, you know, late in the summer kind of early fall that we're going to start seeing it right well and uh they've probably stored all the energy they need and uh they're pretty much done anyway so. yeah they're not going to produce much more photosynthesis for for, for example so we're, we're kind of getting into fall right. Tis the season uh, one of my favorites <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely well in this last one here we uh we try to drive home the dangers of spider mites i guess and uh, this one didn't come into us i snagged this off one of the facebook garden groups but that is a pretty prime example of spider mites gone wild right there it is so you know we've talked about aphids and spider mites having that short turnaround time on you know on you know spitting out babies and spider mites are definitely one of them and if we don't wash them off or can kind of control them a little bit population can build up to the point where they're building nests, they're building webs 
Um, this looks like a fall webworm. You know, I, we've seen a lot of fall webworms around, and this looks like a, a worm building nest, and and um, you know, it's very similar. And you know, that spray is going to be hard to get into. Um, that looks like a dusty miller to me. Um, I think that's what it is, but um, you know, you normally don't see fighter mites on dusty millers, but but you know that that is one. So you know, it's an annual. I'd probably just cut that thing off and throw it away. Uh, is probably how I would control it. I don't know if I would spend the time or money and, and extra spray to uh, to control them because we're kind of again on an annual. I think you know those annuals are ready to to be pulled up almost anyway and. Dang, we're going to be talking about pansies before long, but <laughs> but uh, that that's a that's a spider mite web, and there's spider mites in there. Probably a two spotted spider mite, if I'm guessing. So. Right. Well, and if you, if you did want to uh, try and do something about it, I think the the plan would probably be you need to break open that web and split that open so you could spray inside of there rather than just spray on top of it because it may not penetrate that web. Right. That is that is correct. Right. Yeah, spider mites tend. You know, we always say spray on the on mites and, and aphids. Spray the underside of the leaves. Make sure you get everywhere on that spray um, because they are hiding everywhere. Right. And um, again, quick turnaround. So you may want to come back and spray three or four days later. That way, if they are some that escaped, then we could we could get them get them killed. Uh, uh, get that second round killed again. Well, and as far as what to spray, I, I would say probably uh, insecticidal soap, maybe and uh, and or neem oil would be probably mm -hmm. my first go to. Do you agree with that? Yeah, and we're kind of getting where we can kind of maybe do some insecticidal soap and make it a little thicker, or some some oils, um, you know, some summer oils, make it a little thicker than what we could have done uh, back in the summertime. That thick oil will sometimes burn or that thick mixture will sometimes burn leaves when we are hot. So I think we can, we can increase that viscosity uh, essentially of that, of that uh, insect, you know, that horticultural oil to maybe do a little better job. So you may can try that. Um, the, the neem oil can work too, but try the insecticidal soap and the horticultural oil. Uh, and then see what see what happens. I think you'll be all right. But like I said, if it's mine, I'm probably going to pull it out. It looks like it may even be in a pot, um, right. so we can cut it and throw it away. You'd pull it out and go get ready to plant some pansies, right? Yep. It'll be <laughs> it'll be time. It'll be time. I don't know if the nurseries are getting them yet, but I it's gonna it's close. It's They're close. out there. They're out there. I can tell you. Well, that about wraps it up for today. The main thing is if you want to reseed your fescue, now is the perfect time to do it. And uh, don't use the pre-emergent first if you're going to. And uh, anyway, we appreciate you all being here. Appreciate you, Brian. And uh, we will see you all next time. Sounds good. See you all in a couple of weeks. We'll have it out there. All right.